Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to him be all glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, I find it very interesting that the words of both John the Baptist's ser uh, first sermon as well as the Lord's preaching are the exact same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, on the one hand, Jesus' repetition of John's message shows a continuity between the prophet and the Christ, though they are different preachers and with different purposes, their wor words build upon each other's. God had sent both the Baptist and the Christ, so their words should be consistent, right? Well, yes, the words are the same. The question for today is, are there messages? Now, the word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which is best translated as to change one's mind or one's purpose. And it is rendered in both instances as a present participle. That is, it's an ongoing action to be undertaking, be repenting. So rather than a singular act of performance, both John and Jesus are speaking of an attitude that we adopt because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It implies that we are to have a penitent mindset, a repenting spirit. The first of Martin Luther's 95 theses states, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. This is the essence of what it means to be repenting. He continues, repentance is begun when we acknowledge our sins and are sincerely sorry for them. It is completed when trust in the mercy of God comes to this sorrow and hearts are converted to God and long for the forgiveness of sins, to quote the great reformer. Both terror and trust are a part of penitence. Terror at the wrath and the condemnation of God if we refuse to acknowledge our sins and trust that if we do, God will hear our confession and grant us forgiveness. It is as the word of God tells us. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Repent. When we hear that word most often, our minds rush to envision the street side prophet holding up his cardboard sign reading, Repent! The end is near! We hear the word, Repent. And in our mind we can think of some fire and brimstone traveling evangelist pounding his pulpit and shouting, Turn or burn! We hear, Repent. And our automatic response is fear. We're afraid because deep down we know that the wrath and the judgment and the condemnation of God is what we deserve. We know the truth of Paul's words to the Ephesians. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That is what terrorizes our souls and troubles our consciences. The knowledge that we are sinners standing before the throne of the holy and righteous God. As John the Baptist called the people to confess, to be baptized in repentance, the chastened flocked to the waters. When the religious types showed up, John challenged them to repent, saying, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Fear and terror are a common reaction to hearing John's words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But what if I were to suggest to you that repent can also have a gospel perspective, that rather than only hearing the law when you hear the word repent, that maybe God is issuing a gracious invitation to you. That rather than focus on the terror 
of repentance, what if we were to concentrate on the trust of turning to God? Today's Old Testament reading from the prophet Isaiah is also part of today's gospel reading from Matthew. Now you need to remember Isaiah lived somewhere around the 7th century BC. That's 700 years before Christ's arrival. Now in the previous chapter Isaiah had told the people that they were going to be experiencing some rough days ahead. Specifically, he prophesied the Assyrians' attack and victory against the northern kingdom of Israel. He tells them of how they will be overrun and the people will be dispersed and scattered from the land. But then he goes on to tell them, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And Matthew incorporates that same prophecy in his gospel reading, where he tells us when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. That region of Zebulun and Naphtali had been part of the northern tribes of Israel, which suffered greatly when Assyria attacked and conquered the northern kingdom, just as the prophet had said they would. Their Jewish population was largely resettled from away from their homes. Many of them were actually forced to marry into other races and other people groups. So for hundreds of years, the days felt dark and gloomy. And then new light arrived in the person of Jesus. A new time of hope was inaugurated merely by the presence of the Christ who had come into their midst. And from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was good news emanating from a region and a people who could use some. Isaiah's vision also speaks of the impact of the Messiah's coming when he says, you have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they were glad when they divided the spoil. John's call was to prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight by preaching repentance to the people whose hearts were then convicted by the Holy Spirit. Jesus now comes and he speaks of repentance and joy breaks out. Why the difference? Well, if you will, join with me toward the end of Matthew 4, picking up at verse 23. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. See, John's preaching was to make straight, to prepare the Messiah's way, a preaching of law that would result in the people going out to him, being baptized by him, and confessing their sins. His purpose was to call the people to repent, to turn away from their sins. Jesus' preaching was the proclaiming of the gospel, that is, good news of the kingdom. This gospel proclaimed was also accompanied by signs of Messiah, specifically the healing of the sick and the affirmed as examples of how God's kingdom was both different and far superior 
than the kingdoms of men who often marginalize those who suffer. His purpose was to invite people to come and to see and to experience the grace of God. Repent, that is, as you're turning away from your sin, turn to God's love and mercy. And while the penitent heard John's call to repentance through confession, the multitudes from all over the area flocked to be with Jesus. We can see repentance has two sides to it. We turn from our sins and we turn toward God. King David knew about this double-edged sword of repentance, of turning away from sin while turning in faith to God. And this morning he poses a very simple question. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And he then goes on to say how he tries to live his life with that sure and certain hope of God watching over him as he penitently makes his way through his days following the Lord's leading. And that is precisely what Luther is implying when he tells us that our entire life is one of repentance. That we are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It is Jesus whose call to repent is a gracious invitation to turn to God, to discover the wonders of his love and his mercy. Though it's not in our hymnal, there's a wonderful contemporary hymn. The words of its chorus, I believe, are most poignant. It goes like this. Turn your eyes toward Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Repent, dear friends, and turn your eyes toward Jesus, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And all God's people said, And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ unto life everlasting.